So greetings everyone. Welcome once again to the 94th session of the online Optum learning series or OOLS. Let me introduce to you our speaker for today. So today we are honored to have Professor Glenn Steele. He is a pediatric professor at the Southern College of Optometry. He is also the past chair of the American Optometric Association Foundation Infancy Committee and also the past president of the College of Optometrists in Vision Development and the Optometric Extension Program Foundation. He has a vast experience, I think over four to five decades of experience with which he lectures extensively throughout the US and also internationally, specifically in the areas of vision development and care in the infant and young child. And with that experience, uh, today Prof is going to talk to us about autism and how can we play a role as an optometrist in vision issues pertaining to autism. So welcome Prof uh, onto our platform. Thank you so much for giving us your time on a very Sunday early morning for you. Uh, let me leave the screen time to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I um, uh, hope that, uh, that what I have to say will be beneficial for you, uh, mostly students. So I think uh, there will be some uh, particular uh, nuggets in here for you. Um, but this is designed mostly for the, the general uh, optometric practitioner. This is not for a VT pediatric specialty uh, uh, session. And, and so keeping that in mind uh, as we get on in, you'll see so many things that you do every day that will give you a, a, um, a background to be able to see these patients and, and develop a concern of whether or not uh, autism is there. Now, having said that, I'm not going to charge you as an optometrist with making the diagnosis of autism, but more when the diagnosis is made or finding early signs that lead to uh, diagnosis of autism, those are the kinds of things that we want to do. Um, I have um, uh, no disclosures. I, well, there we go. Uh, let me turn this back off. I don't get money from anybody except that. Okay, what is autism? Autism is a very complex uh, condition. Uh, there are many, many um, people who say, well, it's definitely this, it's definitely this, and they're, they're at the extremes. So somewhere in the middle probably is, is uh, a good thing. But it's a common developmental disorder that includes problems with social interaction and communication. And it ranges from mild to disabling in, um, let me take that down, um, to disabling its severity. Now, many times you think, oh, well, these autistic kids, they come in and, and they're walking on their toes and they're flapping their hands and they're loud and they can't. Well, that's a part of it. But most of the kids on the spectrum have uniquely awesome abilities, which they're not often able to express because of their social inadequacy. Um, uh, the, the Many of the people who are really, really bright uh, in a particular area uh, have other characteristics of autism. Uh, I'm sure you know people who are, again, really, really bright, but they can't communicate with you on a general basis. So uh, the, those people are on the spectrum too. So don't, don't think that they're um, always this a oh, very complex person that you have to deal with throughout. There are patients that are in your chair every day. Prior to 2010, uh, one in 1,500 was described as having autism. Now, that's 10 years ago. 10 years ago, one in 1,500. 
in 2012, two years later, it was down to one in 150. But they began then to include other kinds of things in the spectrum rather than just autism, such as Asperger's syndrome or, or whatever. And as, as I go through, should I mention ASD, that stands for Autism Spectrum Disorder. In 2013, a year later, it was down to one in 88. And now in 2020, one in 54 people are described as having autism. Now think about that change. What could cause a change such as that? And, and to me, it's, it's just a, a more inclusive description and definition of the process so that we call autism. Um, most of those people you would meet on the street and not uh, recognize anything different except uh, just weren't very friendly. There's one in 34 boys and one in 144 girls. So it's much more prevalent in boys than it is in girls. 44% have IQ scores in the average to above average range. So, you know, keep that in mind when we're talking about autism. Um, the, the, these, these people uh, are bright to above average in, in um, intelligence. The cause multifactorial. I, I think the, the problem comes whenever you have to, whenever people try to make a single cause and ascribe that to autism. Um, I think there are multiple causes. I've even seen some kids where uh, I've seen two and I've had colleagues report others where if you overplus them, let's say they're plus plus four on a cycloplegic, if you overplus them with that full amount, they begin to show characteristics of autism. Some of them even started walking on their toes and, and, and not being able to communicate as well. So, uh, but I'm not going to say every time you do that, you're going to cause autism symptoms uh, or signs. Um, the, the, the same thing with many of the other things that have uh, been linked to autism. I think it's just there's so many factors to, to, to make it one factor is, is not uh, uh, appropriate. Now, in this one in 54 group, you often never know. But at other times, it's very obvious. Um, I was in... Um, um, fast food restaurant. And yes, I do eat fast food occasionally. Um, my wife makes sure we, we, we don't do that very often, but we were in, in, in this restaurant and I, I noticed whenever I went to get a refill on my tea that, um, uh, this young man, um, uh, had a beard mustache, um, bumped into me as I was going up to get my drink and uh, didn't say excuse me, anything. He just was focused on getting back to his table. And I got my drink, came back and sat down, and all of a sudden something triggered this, this outburst of, of, of sounds, very, very loud sounds. Um, Parents were trying to control him, and the more they tried to control him, the louder it got. There were uh, uh, other people there in the restaurant, and they began to become alarmed. The parent tried to give him uh, a, a pill to help him calm down. He refused to uh, open his mouth to take the pill in um, and continued to be loud, and finally they, they just got up and left. Uh, so some of them like that, they're very obvious. But think of the parents. This is not just a small diagnosis of autism. Think of the parents who deal with this every day. Now, this, as I said, was a young man probably in his early to mid-20s, um, th th still living at home, still under parents' care because he couldn't manage and control himself outside of of, of, of that and so the parents still have to do something those people are those parents are saints but then take it a bit further all during his life they've never been able to go or uh, you know i won't say never but rarely are they able to go out and just have 
a, a, a couple's evening, uh, a couple's day away, a couple's weekend, a couple's vacation, because very few people want to sit. Uh, I almost use the word babysit, but you don't use that word with a 20 something year old, um, but, but would be able to, to, to provide care for somebody that age who has an outburst uh, who, with, from who knows what, you know, what triggers the outburst? The parents probably know to some extent, but again, these people are, th th this becomes now a family thing. And now what happens if they have siblings? Um, there was a movie a number of years ago uh, called Rain Man. And it starred um, uh, Tom Cruise and I even forget the other person who played Rain Man, Raymond. But they, he called himself Rain Man, but his name was Raymond. Uh, but he was a sibling. He really became a caretaker in daily life for Raymond. But, but most of the time, it, it, it has an impact on siblings too. And it limits their social engagement, especially in younger life, uh, because they can't, Dustin Hoffman was the, the was Raymond. Uh, but it affects their lives early on, especially too, because they can't uh, engage in all the social, physical, sports activity that they might want because they've got a, a, a sibling at home who, who come just, just demands a lot of care. Now, when, when uh, we begin to, to first see some of this, um, um, a number of articles that came out. This one came out last year, but I want to go back in a minute to one that came out about 10 years ago uh, in the optometric literature. This is from uh, Journal of the American um, Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus um, just over a year ago. Ophthalmic disorders were found in 71% of children with ASD evaluated our university-based ophthalm ophthalmology clinic. Now, that was one that was in the ophthalmology clinic, and then they just selected out the kids who were on the spectrum. And they found 71% of them, they found some sort of ophthalmic disorders. Um, this one came from Autism Research. One-fourth of the children on the spectrum are undiagnosed. So if we combine these two um, um, articles, both of them from 2019, if one-fourth of the kids on the spectrum are undiagnosed and 71% of the children have some sort of ophthalmic disorder, then it really points out the fact that we as optometrists play a role in uh, management and care of kids on the spectrum. One of the first ones, as I said, was 2009. Uh, Lynn Press and Jack Richmond uh, wrote uh, in the role of the optometrist in early detection of autism spectrum disorders. And, and what clearly was shown is the absence of eye contact, unresponsiveness to facial gestures, and or difficulty in sharing joint visual attention are signs of abnormal or atypical visual development. Now, one of the things that we have to do is we have to sort out, is this absence of eye contact, is this unresponsive to facial gestures, simply something that has is lacking in their overall development and particularly visual development, or are you beginning an early identification of a child on the spectrum that needs intervention from multiple sources? So a lot of early indicators that are related to vision. Many of them you, I, I never thought about, and I've been working in, in kids with uh, uh, developmental issues for 50 years, but I never linked these kinds of things to, develop, to, uh, to autism. Pupillary reflex, we'll talk about all of these more depth uh, in a minute. Blink reflex, gaze following, attention, ocular motor function, choice of fixation target uh, and, and, and the way they do. 
slower binocular rivalry. So all of these are sh coming out in the literature now that that we identify. There, th those are things we do in practice every day with patients. We check the pupillary reflex. We don't necessarily uh, uh, directly attend to the blink reflex, but I think you'll see as I talk about it later how all of these things really um, can lead to um, a diagnosis of autism. And again, keep in mind, I'm not going to charge you nor myself with making a diagnosis of autism because there's there's no blood test you can do to uh, determine autism. The, the, you know, this it's nothing like that, but it's a compilation of indicators in a syndrome. Parents will often ask, oh, why don't they look at me? And many times parents will force the kids. They'll take the, the, um, uh, uh, their head and force them to look at them. Uh, but again, remember that they have a difficulty in joint attention. We'll get into that. The best way to induce anxiety in children with autism is to insist that they look at you. So remember that pearl as you go through. Um, and, and you can help parents with that. And, and I'm going to give you ways that you can position yourself in the room um, and, and while the patient's in your chair and then begin to communicate to parents, what are some kinds of things I can do? Why don't they look at me? Um, because it makes them anxious. And, and then you, if, if there are other things that, um, uh, that are going on, and it makes them anxious, then you're triggering one of the outbursts like you uh, described with the child at the restaurant. One patient said, I can see you or I can hear you. Which one do you want? In other words, I can look at you or I can hear you. But if I look at you, I can't hear. And can string together the commands that, for the task or I can hear you but I can't look at you at the same time. And that's why you'll see so many of these kids will look away when they're talking with you. Um, I had um, uh, another patient about five years old, had been out of the country with grandparents for several years while the parents were here studying and now is here with the parents. And, and they were really concerned because she'd been diagnosed as being on the spectrum and, and they didn't, the, the, the child didn't look at them and they said, what in the world can, can we do? Well, in, in doing my test, I just happened to have my, my clicker with me that I, uh, you can see the, uh, uh, maybe the, the laser pointer. And, you know, some uh, students, some of these things you'll learn strictly because that patient's sitting there in your chair and you say, what if I try this? There's, there's nothing that, that I can teach you that will work for every patient, every visit. But there are many, many things I can say. You can try this. It might not be exactly because you might not have a clicker and a laser pointer in your hand. But I just happened to put the laser pointer pointed on the floor to see if they would look at it. Well, they didn't look at it, but they saw it and the child accurately grabbed the spot where the laser pointer was, no matter which side, but they continued to look straight ahead so they could accurately see straight ahead. Now, I'm sorry, they could accurately see to each side and locate. And, and do. But let's, let's now apply that to, to school. How are they going to operate in school if they can't look and focus on words, on the teacher, on the things that they need to have every day? So this is the kind of thing that, that, that you're going to encounter. Most, most of the adults on the spectrum indicate they become overwhelmed by the intensity of looking directly in your eyes. It feels very intimidating and very scary. Very intimidating and very scary to an adult. And imagine what this might be happening with a much younger child. Some can communicate, some can't communicate. I would say most can communicate with you, but kids don't know necessarily how to, uh, to communicate that that's intimidating and scary. Excuse me a second. 
So <clears throat> use those kinds of things. Some children use peripheral vision to, to view things. And that's why I was given the example of just the laser pointer. You can take a pen light and put a light down there on the floor. It doesn't have to be the laser pointer. You can put pieces of paper down there on the floor. But they use uh, peripheral vision to identify those things. Direct vision is too intense and it's overwhelming, so they look with their peripheral vision. Again, put them in a classroom now where they have to look and, and engage visually they're not able to do that. Not able to do that without anxiety and without being able to, or without going into these outbursts. When they're concentrating on you, they'll appear to be looking away from you because they have difficulty maintaining eye contact and responding to their questions. So don't be offended if, if they look away from you to answer your questions because they can hear you or they can see you. They can hear you and interact with you, or they can see you, but they can't do both. They have difficulty doing both at the same time. I think can't is too strong a word there, but they have difficulty doing both at the same time. Therefore, forcing a child to look at you is not increasing their understanding as it would be in a typical child. Look at me. Do you understand this? And they'll say yes. But it's oftentimes Forcing them to look at you is inhibiting the communication because it totally overwhelms and distracts them. So the harder you force them to look at you, the poorer your information will be. So, uh, you know, whereas you say to a, uh, um, a, a five-year-old that's a typical child, typically developing, then look at you, look at me, look at my target and follow that. That will be more, um, um, you'll get more traditional information there. But if you force the kid on the spectrum to look at you and their response decreases, that's an inkling that, that um, there might be something more than just the child doesn't want to look at you. Like most of us, Looking at someone is much easier when we do it under our own volition. In other words, I choose to look at you. I choose to look at somebody else when they're talking. But it's, in, it's intimidating, though, when somebody prompts you, and there's, even as adults and, and a, a typically developing adult, sometimes if they say, look at you, sometimes you just have to look away to think. So you've got to differentiate. Are they just looking away to think and they come back to me or are they looking away and don't come back? So just sort those kinds of things. It's the same for all communication. Children with uh, on the spectrum will look at you more frequently when indirectly invited to do so, not told to do. So many times you'll be talking to them and you can come down. One of the things gets softer in your voice. Uh, I I'm, I'm tend to be boisterous and loud when I come in the room, but a lot of it's to see what the child's reaction is. But, but it's, it's okay to, to soften your voice and they'll oftentimes look at you more and engage with you more that way and sitting up when you're sitting off to the side, rather than telling them to look at you and being forceful and loud yourself. So here's some tips uh, in the examination that you might find the child being able to look at you more often. And these are just tips. Try it one child, try a different one on another child, or may, you know, they may respond differently. But here's some things. Position yourself so you're not directly in front of him, but at eye level. For instance, I'm going to try to come over to the side of my screen where you can see uh, my folders and my papers and my, my part of my, my home library behind me. But I'm talking over here. Now, many of you will follow me over to the side of my screen, but getting right in front of the child and, and is, is the intimidating part. So move over to the side. When your face is in his field of vision peripherally, it will get their attention better because just positioning yourself in front of them in a way is forcing them to look at you. And if you continue to try to move wherever they're looking, they will continue to try to avoid you. 
often you can see them smiling when you're over to the side, whereas if you're directly in front, they're not going to smile, frown, and they'll frown and show the anxiety in, in trying to do that. Now, that doesn't mean getting in the face. That just means in their field of vision. So over to the side, you'll be in their field of vision for you. Use minimal words and more nonverbal language can, when communicating. Um, sometimes you'll say, look at my target. And if you say, look at my target, they, that, that's hard for them to do. But again, remember, the, the, the initially, whenever I had the, point, the laser pointer, they would look at that and do that. So if, if you're trying to, let's say, evaluate ocular motility, eye movements, uh, typically you would have a target where you would, you would just have them look and follow the target and you would evaluate that. With kids on the spectrum, you may want to do things over to the side and have them touch and have them touch. In other words, rather than directly in front, come over to the side and have them touch. Come over to the other side and have them touch and look and you'll know, are they seeing that uh, and, and what are they doing? Use more animated facial expressions. Smile yourself. Exaggerated gestures rather than saying, look at me, point. Do things like that to the things you want them to do. This invites them many times to reference your face to, uh, to, to gain the information you need. So if you start doing this in gesture, many times they will then look at you to see what's going on. What is it you really want them to do? And whenever they stop referencing you, Try pausing briefly until the attention returns. Now, I said his there because the majority are boys, um, but, but uh, until their attention returns. Sometimes whispering your instructions is helpful. So if you're talking in a regular tone and they tend to be losing you, then maybe start whispering. I do that quite often with young babies because then they'll start looking because they, they, they need the concentration of looking to hear. Kids on the, who are on the spectrum will also respond much. Change lighting. Um, I will many times have a switch that, uh, uh, that I turn on and off in the room. Now, I don't turn it completely dark because I have an, um, a small overhead light on, but change the overall room lighting. I work in a room where I, I have full illumination. I don't work in a dark room because kids don't go to school in a dark room. Kids don't do things primarily in a dark room. So I want to see what their ability is there. But what happens whenever I turn the big lights in the room off? When I say big lights, I mean, I, I have a small light right over the chair, plus uh, two sets of fluorescent lights uh, in the room. I turn the big fluorescent lights off, the big bank of lights off. So I've just got the one on them. Does that change the way they begin to look? Uh, on the kids who are severely disabled with autism, that might not change much. But on the kids who are more uh, mildly on the spectrum, that's going to change and get them to looking. It changes in other senses, you know, where change lighting, change hearing, um, and, and many times even change touch. But they, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. But this break in the constant interaction invites the child to check back with you to repair the breakdown. So there's been a breakdown in communication. There's been a breakdown in, in lighting, in sound. And other. So they're going to check back in and look at you. Do they have that ability? For many young children, their eyes follow your hands. So that's why uh, exaggerated gestures are so important. So... For those, if they feel safe, I may bring their hands up to the side of my face. I may have them, I have kids many times, just clap my hand, give me five, do those kinds of things. And if they'll let you, I'll even bring it up. Now, this is before the pandemic, uh, but I bring them up and let them touch my face because they get a different feel from my beard um, than, than they do just regularly. But I'll see what, what happens there. Do they engage in face? Many of them don't like touch. So if they don't like touch, you've got to be careful because 
uh, with with any lenses or glasses that you use, will they be able to wear them? And and so then you've got to go through a process with parents of how do you get them to wear the glasses that you need? And do do all these things in in a, a time frame of sharing positive emotion, so they'll re, uh, reference a positive gaze. The more positive you can be, the more positive you can 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 communicate uh, with them, then the more likely you are to engage them. But that helps develop positive associations with looking at you, not straight ahead demanding it, but off to the side where they now choose to look at you rather than being forced to look at you because you're straight ahead. Now, um, in, invite facial referencing. Now, I'm describing facial references, glancing at your face for information or to share a positive moment, not necessarily eye contact. Many times that contact will be right in looking you in the eye, but it may not be there. Don't demand eye contact and definitely don't hold their head to turn their face towards you. Uh, I've seen parents do that too often. And, and that's one of the things you have to, to, to uh, uh, communicate with parent about don't turn their face to, to, to look at you and don't demand eye contact all the time. There may be times when you need to do that. If the child is relaxed and feels safe with you and you've uh, set up all of these positive mo means of communication, they'll be more likely to reference your face. And if you demand it, they'll be scared to look at you. Relating is about feeling safe and accepted, not instructed. And, and isn't that the way most of us are? But these kids have just much more uh, much more often will have breakdowns in communication that you need then to repair and make them feel safe. Now, some of these ideas came not from me, but from uh, an article in um, uh, Autism Discussion page uh, entitled The Core Challenges of Autism. And this was by Bill Nason, uh, an autism specialist. Um, you'll, you'll see that a lot of the things that I will reference are outside of the profession of optometry because optometry has not been engaged and especially general primary care optometrists have not been engaged in communicating with the, with uh, people on the spectrum and and you need to to hand manage these kids differently uh, so hopefully some of that will be beneficial for you now Tip for parent, the worst time to demand eye contact is when you're angry and scolding because that's going to make the contact even worse for a longer period of time. It's very intimidating. It sends a strong negative association with looking. And you want to send a strong message, but the message that you send by demanding eye contact is a negative association, and especially if that's the only time you demand eye contact is when you're scolding them, you need to, to reference yourself. So what do we need to do? And how does this involve optometry? You know, all, all of these kids um, uh, have issues. 71% have visual issues. So we need to look at the kinds of things there. So, we, you know, we do routine exams. I'm, I'm working in a pediatric primary care clinic. So in some ways, I, I am uh, specializing in kids. All the kids I see are generally 12, and 12 years of age and, un, and younger. Um, but, but what I want to show here is the protocol I use for evaluating a patient on the spectrum is no different than what I would a typically developing child. I want a history. I want ocular motility, but give special attention here. I want binocular function. I want to look at refraction. I want to look at visual acuity. And, and I want to look at eye health, and especially blink reflex and pupil responses. And as I said, we'll get into those in, in, in just a second. But aren't these the same kinds of things, the same six areas you look at 
whenever you're uh, evaluating a typical child or whenever you're evaluating an adult. You want to know what the history is. So if, if the child doesn't develop appropriate tracking ability from very early because they make in, there's a greater chance they'll not develop appropriate binocular function or refractive testing, uh, testing will show fluctuations. So uh, uh, do a whole separate lecture on what, what does the look it mean? If you don't start looking first, you're not going to develop binocular uh, function to the level that would be expected for their age. And then if you don't develop the ability to look, even in refracting testing, you're going to get fluctuations and modulations. Um, so that that's such a foundational aspect. And if you see here, ocular motility is one of the first areas that I tend to. I, I, I have these ranked in orders of, of priority of importance for me, with the exception of eye health. Obviously, if there's a, an, an eye health issue, that takes priority. But but I want to know, can they look? And, and, and if they can't look, then you're going to have reduced binocular function, you're going to have reduced visual uh, uh, refraction, and you're going to have reduced visual acuity. So think about those kinds of things all the way through. Don't assume this is just a child who hadn't developed an ability to pay attention. Paying attention is so critical to everything in life. Um, but many times, most of the time, these kids on the spectrum don't pay attention, and especially don't pay attention with eye contact. Developing attention, paying attention is very important from birth onward. So if this is difficult for them, then life is going to be much more difficult for them. And remember, I haven't said anything to this point about intelligence. And you're not going to hear me say much about intelligence because 44% of these kids have average to above average intelligence. So it's, it's not a matter of developing intelligence. They just go about doing that in a different way than in typical development. So let's look at some things. Look at let's look at pupil responses. We we look at pupil size, <clears throat> and we look at pupil size to uh, uh, determine a number of things. One of the things I'm seeing now with kids who are uh, on video games a lot is a marked increase, a persistent increase in pupil size. That's a persistent increase in the sympathetic response, even after they're not working with the game. But what else? You just don't have an isolated visual sympathetic response. What else? What's happening with heart rate? What's happening with breathing? What's happening with the gastro issues? I mean, think about all the things that are involved, and especially students. You might be thinking, oh, I have to learn this sympathetic and parasympathetic. It, it does have an effect in life and in things they do. So if I'm seeing this persistency after a, a child puts down their, their um, game, what what all is happening what in the rest of the body so it can give you clues for example you might show a child two images side by side and see which one they look at longer and in measuring the size of a baby's pupil could do the same without needing a comparison so i take my retinoscope I always have my retinoscope handy and and i can look at the the child's pupils and i can can um, look to see how they respond. Now, this is from Perspectives on Psychological Science in 2012, again, eight years ago. Um, so, so all of these things are fairly recent. So they're beginning to use pupil size. If, they're, if you're showing them two images side by side and you want to see which one they look at longer, you, you don't. You, in addition to timing which one they use longer, look at the pupil size. Is the pupil size different looking at one versus looking at the other? So these are people outside of optometry and eye care that are using that to make a comparison. We found that participants with uh, on the spectrum showed significantly longer um, pupillary light reflex latency. In other words, 
the, the, the time it took them to react to light was longer. There was smaller constriction amplitude and lower constriction velocity than children with typical development. So kids on the spectrum, when you just do a pinlight pupillary response, they don't immediately begin to contract. When they do, they don't contract as much as you would expect. And then the speed with which they contract, you know, you, you turn a light in somebody's eye, you expect to see a, the speed with which they contract is slower than with typical development. And this is from Journal of Autism Developed Mental Disorders um, in 2009. So just look at the pupillary reflex. How is that reacting? just by doing something you do with every patient on every visit. Another article from uh, this was presented in the annual International Meeting for Autism Research uh, 2010, have shown that children and young adults with autism have prolonged latency and less constriction of their pupils in reaction to light. So the article I showed you before is not an isolated article. Now we're seeing more and more articles that show less constriction of the pupil and prolonged latency. Pupil size is also related to accommodation. So if they're not responding as quickly and they're not responding as much, what does that tell you going on with accommodation? And I will have an accommodative target there many times and watch with my retina scope. Um, I, I don't have my target here, but I will have a target just below my retina scope and, and have them uh, call out letters or things there. What is their response to accommodation as they do that? Now, you may have a child who is just has not developed that. And we'll talk about how to separate those and how to differentiate those shortly. If your pupil doesn't decrease, it can be assumed the child's not, oh, I said really, not effectively looking is the word I should use there. Um, if your pupil doesn't fully constrict, then they're not fully focusing on there. So if it doesn't decrease at all, they're not even looking there. If it doesn't fully constrict, they haven't fully focused on there. And, and again, I'm watching this with my retinoscope. So again, pupil size is related to accommodation. If the pupil is slow and constricted and being assumed that accommodation is slow in responding. And these affect all these all affect the effort in learning and working. If you can't sustain accommodation, if you can't focus, if you can't do those kinds of things, it's going to have a major impact on their ability to focus in the classroom, sustain focus in the classroom. And that's the easiest to observe when assessing with, with, uh, um, with um, your retinoscope. Now, I don't have lenses in here, but I will have flipper many times with plus or minus two, a small set of letters here, and I will have them flip, flip with plus two, flip with minus two, What's their response when they're trying to do that? Uh, watch and see how it, 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 does the pupil constrict? Do they even link it with accommodation? Here's an interesting uh, thing I found. Subjects who improved in the pupillary responses when they had fevers, all were tested without fevers, and then they tested them with fevers, had larger constriction amplitudes, very similar to normal controls, whereas those not improved with fever had amplitudes less than the autism group as a whole. So if you take the autism group here, those that had larger amplitudes were, were much, much uh, uh, more effective and, and very similar to, con to uh, typical controls. Whereas those who had fever with less than the, uh, the, the that, that showed less amplitude, generally it was l on the other end of the spectrum, not even where the typical response was and not where their response was before. Fever has an effect. And if for some reason, a number of studies are showing that when a child on the spectrum has a fever, many of their findings and responses move towards what you would typically expect. 
on the children on the spectrum show improvement in language and social interaction when they have a fever. Now, I'm particularly during this pandemic, I'm not saying that you, I, I'm not going to see a, a child who has a fever, uh, rig, whether they're typical, whether they're on the spectrum. But I'm just saying these are studies that have been done. Another in the International Meeting for Autism Research uh, presented in 2010. So th just having a fever, expect so you know it's down there. So what's causing these kids to not be able to interact if you give them a fever and they get sick and they interact better? 17% <clears throat> of children with autism are calmer and more communicative than usual when they have a fever. Children with severe autism features are most likely to show these gains. And that's a little bit opposite of what we said before, one of the things said before. But this was from 2017 in autism research. So here's several <clears throat> different patterns from different authors showing a, a change when a child has a fever. Interesting. Blink reflex. Typical toddlers inhibited their blinking earlier than toddlers with ASD. Now, what do I mean by the blink, blink reflex? A typical child, you show them something to do, they engage, what happens? Their blink reflex, their response to blinking slows down. When you're reading and you're, you are reading and you're reading intently, either studying or in, in a novel that, that's um, a, a mystery and you're trying to figure it out, you blink less. So you inhibit your blinking reflex as you're doing those kinds of things. Kids on the spectrum don't uh, inhibit their blinking uh, because you anticipate the unfolding of events. They don't have that anticipation. So they indicate that measures of blink inhibition are useful quantifiers of atypical processing of social effective signals in toddlers with ASD. Now, blink, blink reflex is not something that you you typically have a test for and and you typically look at but if you're doing that and particularly with my retinoscope and i'm having them look at things i don't expect them to continue the same typical 20 blinks a, a minute response they will, will continue to that the, but the kids on the spectrum will continue that 20 blinks a minute whereas kids with uh, uh, that are on typical development protocol will show that you see less blinking. And if you start noticing that, you'll see it. And this is published in 2011. Uh, the title was Inhibition of Eye Blinking Reveals Subjective Perceptions of Stimulus Salience. Um, you see the name uh, Amy Klein. Uh, that, that's uh, in, in a number of, of uh, autistic uh, research um, papers. Um, so keep watching for that name. When we are looking more intently at something, blink rate decreases or stops when we typical uh, on typical development. So watch the blink, blink rate. Gaze development. Well, what does that mean? That means I'm looking at something. So the, the conclusion, and a lot of them, I'm going to give you the conclusion. Self-initiated, socially directed gaze may be an er infrequent self-initiated, socially directed gaze may be an early marker of later social and communicative delays. They're beginning to identify some of these kids outside of eye care at six months of age, some even younger, but we're starting at six months of age. Now, if they're using eye-related tests to do that, gaze, then I think we should be looking at those kinds of things too. Not only that, this is a political statement. Politically, optometrists should be at the table when those decisions are being made as to what you're looking for in a child on the spectrum. So put yourself in those positions where it's not somebody out here just in a research project that's making this statement. You're now a clinical uh, optometrist. 
put yourself in the situation with those people to do that. This um, um, is from 2010. But infrequent self-initiate. In other words, they don't frequently initiate a gaze looking at you, a socially directed gaze, or engage in something you're doing. Study shows that broader autism phenotype, in other words, a, broad to, a broader autism characteristic, atypical pu response to direct gaze is manifest early in infancy. So they, they say infant, uh, or, or they, you can identify those kinds of things early in infancy. So although gaze behavior at six months of age may not provide early markers for Autism as initially conceived, in other words, leading to diagnosis, gaze to the mouth in particular may be useful in predicting individual differences in language development. So you have to differentiate those. Is this an early marker for autism and do you see some of these other signs? Or is it just a, a difficulty in language development? But what it does, it shows you many times if they don't have that gaze and, and self-initiated gaze, then they will, uh, uh, <clears throat> it could be a, a child who is on the spectrum. There's another study that I include uh, many times, <coughs> excuse me, um, many times that shows that kids who have had head injury if they can show a self-directed gaze, they are more likely to regain language than those who don't develop that gaze. So there are many, many ways of, of testing that we do every day can be very, very revealing in terms of what it may be going on and the potential for some of these kids to develop. So if you can predict individual differences in language development just by watching their gaze, people outside of optometry are making those decisions, then why, can't, why don't we make those two? Typically developing children have the ability to, gaze, to detect direct gaze, whereas children with autism do not. Now, this puts the shoe on the other foot. They're looking at you. Do you have direct gaze? And their ability to, to, to detect that, develop eye contact, and look at you and continue looking at you, children with autism don't have that ability. Altered eye contact behavior uh, hampers subsequent development of social and communicative skills. So if you've got an infant and they're not developing eye uh, contact, gaze behavior, looking at you, then you're setting the stage for um, impairing the development of social and communicative skills. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second, in a little bit in more depth. So um, the, the title of this is 2003 Eye Contact Does Not Facilitate Detection in Children with Autism, but it does uh, detect kids with development of social and communicative skills which are related to autism. Now, keep in mind, that's 2003. That's six to eight years earlier than some of the other articles that, that I've been reviewing. So maybe it's they didn't see those kinds of things in 2003 or weren't addressing those, whereas eight to 10 years, six to eight years later, they were. Eye contact is crucial in achieving social communication. Deviant patterns of contact behavior are found in, in individuals on the spectrum who suffer from more severe, or those who suffer severe social communicative defect, deficits. The results of this study reveal that children with autism were no better at detecting direct gaze than at detecting averted gaze, which is unlike normal children. Now, um, According to the research published in January 20th, uh, current biology, uh, I'm not sure what year it will show later on, the brains of typically developing six-month-old babies react differently to the images facing looking toward them than those looking away. 
The brains of babies who are later diagnosed with autism, however, showed little difference. And this is 2012. Infant neural sensitivity to the dynamic eye gaze associated with later, emer later emerging autism. Now, here's what they're talking about. Which one of these... What, what are you going to do um, if, if you're a typically developing child when you see those two images? Number one, which one are you going to look at? Typically developing children most often, almost 100% of the time, look at the face on the right, the one that is looking directly at you. If they don't, they see the other eye and then they look over to where those, that eye is looking. In other words, they follow their gaze. With typically developing children, it doesn't make any difference. First, they can look at either one with equal um, um, observation. In other words, they don't pay more attention to the one where the eyes are looking directly at them. So these kinds of things uh, are, are, are so important that, that, that they don't get. I found this very, very interesting. <clears throat> um, Meltzoff des defines gaze following as by 12 months of age. You have a 12-month-old infant. You're the parent. The baby looks at you and sees you. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at my cup that's sitting to the side over here. The baby sees you looking at the side. They actively then follow your gaze to see what you're looking at. If they do that by 12 months of age, 18 months of age, they respond to 335 words. Now, at 18 months of age, they're not talking yet. So they're not saying these words, but they respond to those words. If the baby does not respond to active gaze following, in other words, if they don't look at you as a parent, see that you're looking there and see what you're looking at. Remember those two images before. If they don't actively follow, they only respond to 195 words by 18 months of age. That's significant. Time and a half, again, significantly greater words, 140 more words on average in, in a study um, for, for, but between the two. And this is the development of gaze following and its relation to language and language development. Uh, Brooks and Meltzoff, they've done an, a number of of uh, articles on gaze following, but this is the one I found most critical. And this relates to, to the importance of developing ability to track even in a kid who is not on the spectrum. So begin to pay attention to those. Gaze aversion is a cognitive loads management strategy in autism spectrum disorder and Williams syndrome. So they're using gaze aversion, not looking there. It's a load management strategy. I can't look and think at the same time. So I look away so I can think. It's overload here when I'm doing both. It reduces the load when I look away. So that's in 2012. If a baby can follow your gaze and know what you're looking at, they'll have better language skills by 18 months of age. These are not just simple findings that we see at 12 or 18 months of age or, or two years. They can start a cascade of developmental and behavioral issues that can be that can last a lifetime. Um, to go a little bit further here, that when, when they look at these kids at, at 12 months of age that don't follow, they find at two years of age, they show a decrease in developmental abilities. And at five years of age, they show a decreased ability to engage in reading in those kinds of skills that would be necessary for school. So see where they're looking, see how long they can, can sustain attention with you, see how long they follow you. So the low risk groups are more likely to have normal social gazing, infrequent self-initiated, in other words, I choose to, to look at you, socially directed gaze, um, infrequent uh, there may be an early marker of later social and communication delays. So you're going to have difficulty there. Attention. Well, already we know that if they can't look, attention is going to be reduced. They may be able to find that target over to the side very accurately, but direct attention is going to be there. They might play uh, I, uh, this article really struck me. 
ocular abnormalities might play a causal role in functions known to be impaired in autism. I'm not saying abnormal ocular abilities causes autism, but if you don't develop this good central gaze, and if you do it more here, then they practice that and they get better at it. And if they get better at not looking, then they do it looking that carries with them throughout their life. So again, this is from Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. <coughs> Head mount and eye tracking devices they use in another study to record gaze data from both parents and infants. They find that infants extend their sustained attention to an object when a mature social partner also shows visual attention. So now we're getting more into, we've identified this, what do we do? And several studies are showing that babies interact better when somebody is there with them. It's so important from day one. Meltsoff, the fellow I mentioned earlier, um, when his baby was born, he, he was holding him and, and, and within 45 minutes, of just looking at the baby, holding the baby, sticking his tongue out, sticking his tongue out. Within 45 minutes, every time he stuck his tongue out, the baby would stick his tongue out. He'd stick his tongue out, the baby would respond back. It starts that early. He's 45 minutes old. So that's why um, the, it was mentioned earlier that I had been chair of the infant C program uh, within the American Optometric Association. We started seeing babies for routine eye exams at six months of age. That's our recommendation here through the American Optometric Association. It's so important to identify these kids early on because if you find they don't have good attention, you can encourage and do something simply as having a parent Hold them, engage with them, look at them, play with them, because they find infants extend. In other words, they increase their sustained attention when a mature social partner. And, and I'm, I'm finding it doesn't even have to be mature. It can be a peer, same age, but they work better together and they engage more when they're there. That suggests a pathway through which social interactions may influence the development of same, sustained attention. So that pathway is working with them. And that's from 2016 in current biology. Infants who are later diagnosed with autism react adequately when others initiate joint attention, but seldom actively seek to establish such episodes themselves. In other words, <clears throat> these will be kids who are not really um, uh, way down on the spectrum. These, these are higher functioning kids. Um, so if you look at them and they might interact and engage in joint attention with you, but they don't engage it themselves, then they are more likely to be later diagnosed with autism. And this was from the Biological Psychiatry 2019, Joint Attention in Infancy and the Emergence of Autism. It starts so early. It starts so early. Encourage all parents to initiate looking at their baby, looking with their baby from very early. Ocular motor function. Again, we're just the, the, the foundation and the basis comes back to ocular motor function. Although typical eye gaze is commonly observed in autism, little is known about our underlying ocular motor abnormalities. Ocular motor ab abnormalities, we said earlier, might play a causal role there. Ocular abnormalities may play a role as a sensory motor defect. So here's two articles. One's from 2007, uh, don't have the other one. You can see the, the, the two references there. Um, but eye movement and abnormalities in uh, autism and social and non-social. Here's eye tracking. They use eye tracking to examine how 20-month-old toddlers with autism, typical development, and non-autistic developmental delays. In other words, you got a child with developmental delays, a typical developing child, and a child on the spectrum. What they found with toddlers with ASD in comparing to those other two showed less attention to the activities of others and focused more on background objects. Even the kids 
with developmental delays would engage in the task, whereas the kid on the spectrum paid more attention to the background object. ASD kids look less at people's heads, more of their bodies, whereas typically developing toddlers and those with other developmental delays, not autism, but other developmental delays, tended to engage more in direct gaze and self-initiate that gaze. These patterns were associated with cognitive deficits and greater autism severity. So the severity can be linked back to how much do they initiate gaze looking with you. And that was from um, 2011, unlimited activity monitoring in toddlers with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, again, Klein is there in, in that. Most authorities now believe the subtle signs of ASD are present under 12 months of age and eye tracking technology has been used experimentally to detect gaze patterns at progressively younger ages. Now, the reason they use eye tracks from Journal of uh, um, Autism Developmental Disorder, 2002, almost 20 years ago now, they've known that. The reason they find it better with uh, eye tracking devices is because it's, it's uh, an objective test, but it's, they haven't included optometrists in any of this testing because we are many times as accurate or more accurate in engagement. That can only measure where their eyes are looking. We can see what they're looking at. And so if we start paying attention to those, they did a uh, used infrared light, uh, the GeoPref test. I'm not sure what that is to follow baby's eye movement. So they watched a series of movies showing geometric shapes moving around. That tool successfully helped diagnose children with autism at just 12 months of age and in only minutes instead of hours. So they looked at, uh, used uh, uh, infrared light coming back to follow the baby's eye movements and see what they were looking at. And that was just published uh, last year, May of 2020. Uh, fixation on faces, observe fixation on those, um, mouth, eyes, body, and objects. Best predictor of autism was reduced eye region fixation time. And I'm going to hurry on through some of these others. I think we've made the point that, that gaze in looking um, and, and early decline of, of eye movements, or, or, or I, I would almost say lack of development of eye movements, can, can lead to diagnosis, there's Klein again down there, uh, that, that lead to an early suspicion of kids being on the spectrum. Um, that, that one, uh, young children with autism look less at the eyes because they appear to miss the social significance of eye contact. We know as typically developing people, as bright people. You're not in optometry school no matter where you are in your class rank. You're not here uh, because you're stupid. You're here because you're smart. And you're here because you recognize the significance of eye contact. And you look, you look, you look. With autism, look less at the eyes because they appear to miss the social significance. That was in 2016 in American Journal of Psychiatry. So eye contact, and, and, and again, this is just over and over. And if anybody wants a PDF of the slides, uh, just email me. My email will be at the end. Um, our, here's the thing. Our results indicate that in two-year-old children with autism, this behavior, looking behavior, is already derailed, suggesting critical consequences for development, also offering potential biomarker for quantifying syndrome manifestation at this early age. It's already derailed at two years of age. And think of how important the foundation of just looking is in them. That's 2008. Um, we're um, top nine signs your child might have autism. And this is from uh, a website. Lack of smiling by six months, rare imitation of social cues by nine months, Delay in babbling and cooing by 12 months. Unresponsive is to name by 12 months. Poor eye contact within the first three months. Infrequently seeking attention within the first three months. Lack of gesturing by nine months. Gesturing before they can even speak indicates communication. 
gesturing is an early sign of communication. Repetitive behaviors by 12 months that are, are, are atypical. Delayed motor development. That's from the autism site.org. All of those kinds of things are top nine signs that a child might be on the spectrum. I'm not suggesting that eyes or visual issues cause autism, but I am suggesting that if they don't develop those, then there's a chance that the, the, the condition is going to be more severe. <clears throat> And I am suggesting they are prevalent. Signs of autism are prevalent in visual function in the system. They're overlooked because simplified screenings that they get don't address linked findings. They don't address eye movement. They don't address gaze. Most of them simply address 2020 visual or 66 visual acuity. Lack of recognition, there are significant visual issues in the spectrum. Many times people who go out and do screening don't link visual issues that I've talked about today to the spectrum. So, um, we, this uh, editorial from the Journal of the American Medical Association, July of last year, discussed early media exposure in autism spectrum. Many times you'll see these kids on the spectrum, even developmental delay kids, come in and they're on their video, and it's very, very difficult to get the, the, the digital device away from them. And this pandemic has made it even worse. It's easy for a parent to hand them a device and say, uh, uh, go away and let me alone. Now, if you have a child who is on the spectrum, I understand a need to have some alone time as a parent. But you want to be very aware of what else, what's the impact going forward of so many parents give it to them and they look early and look often, especially in the presence of difficulty. Start with a careful history. Does anyone in the family have issues? Place particular emphasis on eye control, eye movement and control. And what are they looking at and how do they look? Calculate or carefully evaluate looking behavior. Refraction is usually not the primary issue. And if you find refraction, particular hyperopia, address that first. That's probably not going to be uh, a child who is on the spectrum, but you're going to have some of the same characteristics that you have to address. The difference is kid, typically developing kids who have high hyperopia, for instance, will respond better, whereas kids on the spectrum don't. I use retinoscopy, I use retinoscopy, I use retinoscopy. I have a technique I call just look retinoscopy. Use retinoscopy not to determine refraction. There are many instruments you can use to, to determine better determine refraction. Look for the kinds of things we're talking about. How are they gazing? What's the pupil size? How does it change in response to a task? And you can do those in just a very short uh, uh, minute. I do that on every patient, every patient. Typical and atypical. And binocular function is present, the chances improve for having a foundation for looking. Many times, binocular function on stereo testing on a six month old is not present. I'm going to have them back sooner and more frequently than I do one who shows me good binocular function at six months of age. Pupillary reflexes, look at those. Blink reflexes, now that you've, you've heard me talk about those, begin to look at those kinds of things. If you suspect something is amiss, what do you do? Do you diagnose autism? No. Do you refer as fast as you can? I think not. I think that, that you don't want to panic. Uh, if you start looking earlier, it's already too late because you're seeing the signs, but remind yourself, I need to start looking earlier on other patients. Initiate activities to stimulate looking, whether diagnosed with autism or not, because what happens if somebody has, has already talked to the parent about autism, whenever it's just, they have, these kids haven't developed a good ability to look and they show you that ability to look. So all this depending on so many factors. Do they have a recent diagnosis? What does the family suspect? Family may be there just because somebody said you need to go get an eye exam and they don't make the link. The person who referred them may not even make the link. So what does the family suspect? What's the perceived severity? Uh, parents will, will, will many times think that behavior is normal when it's not. 
determine whether or not you can get the findings to change in a month. It's not necessary at this point in time to alarm the parent with uh, the word autism. Talk about the findings. I'm seeing that they're not developing this eye movement ability like I should. I want to do that for a month. I want you to do these activities. And, and, and I just talk to them about looking and how do they look. And I want to see them back in a month. If they improve, the severity or of, of autism is decreased or even the, the, the differential has been shown to be not autism. Most importantly, don't panic when you see these kinds of things, because when you panic, the parent panics, and, and that starts a whole cascade of things. So don't panic. It's not necessary to make an immediate diagnosis of autism. If you've got a three-year-old in there, they, they, they've had that for three years, waiting another month. It's not, going, it's not serious like <clears throat> a child with retinoblastoma. You have to make an immediate diagnosis. You have to get them to the proper people who can do that not necessary to make an immediate diagnosis of autism. When I say don't panic, that don't, that, uh, I don't mean be casual about it because being casual also communicates to the parent that it may not be important. Work with community refer resources, but first know what and who they are in your community. Emphasize the concerns, not the diagnosis. You have parents who need to follow up with you. I've got eye movement issues. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about that. I want you to do these things. I want to follow with me. It's okay to monitor without alarming the patient, but not your typical, okay, we'll see you in a year. I don't want to see you in a year. I want to see you in a month. And if the child responds to your management of increasing that, or if you prescribe, need to prescribe glasses, and that increases their, their engagement and their control, uh, you you you've sorted out a lot of things because I will tell you, if you refer, if you say uh, might be some autism, and you refer to somebody, all the things that you're doing with eye movement ability and things are going to be forgotten because now they're focused on autism. The people with autism are focused on autism, and the link that you have made is going to be lost unless you make it there. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about delayed visual maturation. That's a whole different thing. And I've got two or three cases that I've seen with delayed visual maturation that are absolutely incredible. Um, but, but that could be there. So what do parents do? Parents need to get their baby down on their tummy for tummy time. They, all, they won't like it, but it's necessary. Just think about it. if the face is looking down and now they raise their head, vision is going from very close. That begins to get them to moving outside of what I call their circle of understanding. Their circle of understanding is this within arm's reach that the young babies have. It's necessary to get them. Look at your baby when they're feeding, changing, other times when the baby is awake and alert, when you're playing with them. Either down on, get down on the floor and play with them. Don't leave eye contact a chance. Make sure it's there. Look at your baby, especially when doing those kinds of things. Don't leave eye contact a chance. Get, they won't like it. Tummy time involves more than just being on their tummy. Place toys outside of their reach and later. Um, first within reach, then outside their reach. Now, these pictures I'm going to show you are staged, so don't think that. But this is not effective tummy time. Dad's on his phone, not playing with baby. That The baby is looking out at mom taking the picture, but... That's not effective tummy time. This is not effective tummy time with mom uh, on the computer and, and the baby's down there. Get down on the floor at their level. They're more than likely to engage when the parent is playing with them. If you suspect something is missed, initiate activities, stimulate looking patterns, whether they're diagnosed with autism or not. Stimulate looking patterns. Look early, look often. Remember, one in 54 people are on the spectrum. Work with community resources, develop a list, monitor without alarming the patient initially. It's not necessary to begin intervention for autism. It's necessary to begin intervention for eye movement disorders, but it's not necessarily to begin intervention for autism. It was determined that specifically prescribed eye movement activities don't change the looking behaviors. Have a short time frame for follow-up. 
have a list of resources handy. Work as a liaison. <clears throat> Don't just refer the patient and forget them. Work as a liaison between the pay liaison between the parent and the key resource posts. Now, key is to initiate activities and monitor frequently. Encourage parents to be engaged with the baby from birth or as early as possible. If you see them, if you have a mom sitting in your chair and mom is pregnant, talk to them about early engagement, not related to autism, but just to overall development. Make visual activities a part of daily activities for typical and atypical development. Continue to follow on a frequent basis yourself or in contact with a pediatric OD. You may not be comfortable. One of your community resources may be a pediatric OD. Find them pediatric optometrists. If symptoms persist, begin consultation with other professionals outside of optometry. Don't simply refer and assume things are settled. With significant difficulty in ocular motor control, optometry must be involved. We must be at the table. Put yourself at the table. Volunteer. Offer your services in your local community and working with atypical kids. Here are some typical examples in the U.S. Uh, Florida State University, they have a uh, center for autism-related disabilities. But you can go to their website. Where, where That's the beauty of, of, of the, the, the World Wide Web. You can go to their website and find out information. Autism Information Center, Autism Research, the, the Centers for Disease Control, CDC has a campaign, Learn the Science, Act Early for that. Uh, Autism Society for America, Autism Speaks, uh, www.autismspeaks.org. Uh, Kennedy Krieger Institute has uh, a, a lot of uh, resources. Uh, Autism Spectrum Disorders are from the National Institution of Men Mental Health, a part of National Institutes of Health. And there's just too many blogs to mention. There are parent blogs and, 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 and all along there. So find those sources, but determine if there are local resources and formulate that list. There may be somebody working with, with babies that, uh, that have <clears throat> they're on the spectrum that you don't know about. Don't panic. The goal is to find services for the baby. Traumatic for the parents and you, it's not life and death. So it's no need to be in, in, a, in a, an immediate hurry and, and alarm the parents. Become a trusted resource for the parent, even if you are not involved directly in the eventual treatment. Become a resource. You're the one that started this whole process going. You may not offer services, but you can find resources. So I hope this has been helpful for you. Feel free to contact me. There's my email address, gsteel at sco.edu. And um, uh, I'm an email junkie, uh, even at my age. So uh, again, feel free to contact me and I'll be uh, happy to provide uh, resources that, that I have access to. So thank you very much. Okay, so thank you, Prof. I think, uh uh, thank you so much for that very detailed presentation and uh, you know guiding us through on how do we go about autism as well. Uh, just a couple of uh, questions here, Prof. I'm just gonna share that with you. Uh, would you like uh, would you like to comment on whether cerebral visual impairment could be associated with autism? And any thoughts on if underdiagnosed or undiagnosed CVI can be misdiagnosed with this particular spectrum of autism? Um, I don't know that I, I can answer that directly um, because I don't know if th that there is an answer. I'm not aware of studies that have been done comparing those, those two. But I think if you go back to the study that showed um, engagement in uh, comparing typical to kids with developmental delay, and that could include a CVI, and autism. The ones with CVI tended to try to look more effectively than the ones with um, um, autism diagnosis, uh, uh, autism spectrum disorder. So I, I, I think, you know, that you looking and, and eye contact is such a um, such a, a necessary characteristic in making that diagnosis. 
the more you work with kids who have CVI and or ASD and or all kinds of delays, then the easier it will be for you to sort out those kinds of things. Um, if it's your first patient that you see, and you know, we all remember our first patients. If it's your first patient you see <clears throat> that, that has a, a, a delay of any kind, you're probably going to panic. That's why I said, don't panic, but just learn to look at this. I think uh, CVI, take your retinoscope and look. Is it a pattern where they're trying to focus? Because ASD um, uh, kids are not going to focus as well. They're not going to look as well. Now, the um, CVI, I would say, generally is... Um, result of more, um, oftentimes more a result of an accident. Um, and, and so you have a, a defined time period there. Uh, and parents can tell you that. Um, if it's from birth or prior to birth, as far as my management, I don't manage them differently. They've, they've both got difficulty in looking in my uh, responsibility is I want to make sure that I improve their looking ability to the best extent that I can. But I think that's one way. Just pay careful attention to the way they look. Okay. Right. They look. I don't mean look in terms yeah. of how they, <laughs> what they look like, but how are they looking? Yeah. How are they looking at you? What's their attention? Where are they actually directing themselves to? What's, what's their attending? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the next question here is, uh, you know, when it comes to these kids, because of the poor communication, uh, the attendee says they have probably used the videos on muted mode for accommodation testing. Would you like to give any other ways uh, where we can actually assess accommodative function for this? poor verbal uh, response kits? Yeah, uh, again, um, I, I use my retinoscope and, and, and I'm, I'm assessing accommodate. You know, I, I, can, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Can you see me? Okay. <clears throat> I have uh, lenses here. Yeah. Oh, I don't have lenses in, but I, I, I have a um, flipper that has plus twos and minus twos. Exactly. And I want to see what their response is. So I'm doing a facility testing. That's another way of accommodative testing. Too often we, we assess accommodation with a push up. Well, if you've got kids who have poor communication, they're not going to respond as quickly on that. So I take my retinoscope and I will put in plus twos minus twos and i have small letters here to see how are they responding whenever i put plus two in front and minus two in front and yeah. and that gives you a very objective way of looking rather than you know if any of you are involved in vt at all you know you've been uh had the patient who would say clear 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 they get get in a, a routine of saying that and you don't even have the lenses front they're saying clear so you can't always trust that subjectively so that's why i add an objective response to that you can't even on a push-up say oh well yeah now it's blurry watch with your retinoscope and when can you see because when it gets blurry they're going to have a release into less against motion as you as you do that. Um, I like the idea of muted videos uh, to see how they they look. Um, uh, uh, we do have videos, and and sometimes our students have those going so loud that it it annoys me sitting out at my desk. But I like that idea of muted videos to see when they they really look and how do they look. And you take your retinoscope and look and and see how they're looking. Okay. So I think the whole idea is to do retinoscopy, which, uh, you know, basically helps to get most of your uh, 
eye examination or at least you can see a lot of things as you mentioned not just doing the refractive status assessment but and and, and, and exactly and and the hardest part for optometrist is to set refraction aside when we're doing uh, when we're doing retinoscopy. Uh, Jerry Getman, uh, one of my early mentors, uh, said an optometrist tends to develop a palsy <laughs> whenever we pick up a retinoscope. <laughs> we're looking for motion. Set that motion aside, yes. except to say when you put some lenses in front, does the motion change? Are they looking differently? Yeah. I think you very rightly said we have developed some kind of policy after we we get that particular thing. Even uh, when we get that without the lenses, as you say, we start scoping it around and oh, looking. Abs <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, and 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 that that's that's hard. I understand that it was hard for me, you know. But I've been doing it on every patient, every patient, for fifty years now, and and you, I, I'm amazed. Every day, almost, almost every day, I see something different. But it's because I've trained myself now to set refraction aside. Um, I, I see cylinder coming in and going, coming and going. That if, if I were just, uh, um, just concentrating on refraction, that would be so annoying. But to me, that's part of the developmental process, and it lets me know where they are in them. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a whole lecture in itself, but uh, uh, that, that, that's a part of that developmental process that I want to see. Okay. And uh, this is talking about low rating scores. So if the child has low rating scores, does it always mean that he has lower chance of having issues with vision? So I guess these scores uh, we would get the attendee yeah. to talk more about. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe a little clarification. But they have a low rating score in terms of ability. Um, I, I tend to think of it the other way. Okay. And, and, and I tend to think of it as uh, lower autism. Okay, so thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, lower autism rating score. Um, but but uh, even even with these lower autism scores, I tend to I think of vision as uh, as originating inside your gut or inside your head as someone. But vision relates from inside, and what I'm measuring in vision is how do they look out, and and so how do they look out in there? If they have a lower autism rating score and haven't developed the ability to look out, um, then with, with lack of gaze, uh, developing a lack of, of, of um, ability to, to, to continue gaze or follow your gaze, then that sets up a whole cascade of issues in vision later on in development. So whether it's a low autism score rating um, or, or just looking, then your your looking starts uh, is the foundation for binocular function. It's the foundation for refraction. It's the foundation for visual acuity. And if you don't look effectively, looking is the foundation for seeing. And the better you learn to look early in life, the better you see. Now, any kind of rating score, uh, I, I think. You know, people in autism have done rating scores related specifically to autism. People, uh, COVD has developed a rating score related to uh, learning and in the classroom and things like that. Um, <clears throat> the uh, PEDIC study on CI has developed a rating score. So they're, they're perceived to be for those very specific entities. But if you start looking across the board, many of them are the same. If they don't make eye contact and you go to COVD score and they say they don't look or have difficulty sustaining fixation, you know, many of those scores across the board are the same. 
So I think this can work two ways. They have a low low autism rating score. Yeah, we can have issues with vision, but we need to communicate back to the people that that are uh, rating the autism score and say, because he has vision uh, issues in vision, then that's going to make the autism score rating uh, even lower. And, and it's going to have more difficulty in progressing up where they'll show a better rating score. These things are so, uh, vision is so interactive and, and so foundational for all of development, uh, all aspects of development. That's true. That's true. Yeah. And uh, one question about uh, how would you get information about if the autistic kid is seeing more central or they are more towards the peripheral uh, looking uh, habit? Just just watch what they do. Um, uh, okay. the, the one that I was uh, talking about with my uh, laser pointer, uh, we were sitting in the floor. Just watch. Many times, watch what, the way they are when, when they are um, sitting out in the reception area. Uh, before you even actually bring them in for the exam, just watch them make observations there. What are the, what are what is their particular activity? What are they looking at? What are they doing? How are they engaging with parent or a caregiver, whoever brings them? Watch those kinds of things, and that will be able to tell you the ones that are looking, the ones that are more engaged. They're going to be more central. The ones that are not engaged and, and paying attention to everything else around, almost like ADD kinds of things, they haven't developed that ability yet to become more central. Doesn't mean it's not there, but it hasn't developed yet. And the more they practice that peripheral, the harder it is to get them to move from peripheral to central because the peripheral awareness and the peripheral, peripheral engagement becomes their typical pattern rather than as we might see it as an atypical pattern. That's the way they're learning to see. And they don't know any different. That's right. Yeah. And one last uh, uh, question here, just for the interest of the attendees as well. I just wanted your thoughts on, uh, I mean, you did mention that we don't have to panic and, you know, referrals and all that is not to be on the cards, which is you see someone, you need to straight away refer. But if at all we need to refer, who do you think which disciplinary should be first on where we should we should be referring our patients to? Um, that that all depends on who's in your local community, and 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 local may not be just your local. It may be uh, um, I'll just use the U.S. for example. It may be in my state. But but my town is right down in the corner, and we border three states. So okay. it, it could be somebody in any of those states. But it's just exploring around to find out who works with kids on the spectrum. Um, if, if, if you're working in a rural area, people may have to travel more and may, ha may have the ability, may not have the ability to travel. Um, but many of that can be um, uh, done more at home. And I, th I think a lot of these things with young babies uh, it, are, are just helping parents understand what it is related to vision and how to engage them. But, but if vision is an issue, there are other issues, I'm sure. Feeding may be an issue. Hearing may be an issue. Movement may be an issue. Um, controlled movement may be an issue that you might need to involve other people. You might not be involved in vision therapy yourself, but know things that you want to see improved. And, and if you're not comfortable, don't, don't refer to, for instance, an occupational therapist for vision activities finds you an optometrist who provides those activities, but do refer to an occupational therapist for movement activities. And, 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 you know, let's, let's just think a, a, a lot of things. One of these things, again, this is part of a whole separate lecture, but it, it's related to, to digital devices. 
kindergarten in, in kindergartners in Australia are coming in and they don't have the the dexterity skills for writing because they've been on their devices. So they don't have the de- well, okay, everybody's going to be on their devices so you don't need that. But each of you now has a dispensary in your office. Do you have a person 10 years from now who will be able to pick up a tiny screw, put it in the, the frame, take a screwdriver, and tighten the screw. It, you know, it's, it's not just writing skills. It's all of these fine motor skills that are not being developed. And, and these kids that, that attend peripherally don't learn to focus in to be able to do that. So th- there are so many more things. Those kinds of things might need an occupational therapist to do. You might have feeding issues that you, you might need somebody who works with, with, uh, with with babies, uh, young babies who uh, have difficulty with feeding, um, whether it's uh, even, even just milk from, from mom breastfeeding or uh, whether it's when they start taking solid food. These things happen that, that, that early, and um, uh, we can be involved. Knowing, yeah, just knowing what's, what's wrong and then accordingly – referring or you know directing the patient to that channel is is our role as well because when we are examined we know that they have this particular problem and probably if we can't manage it direct them to occupational therapist or behavioral right. or therapist or pediatrician right. and the right. list can go on right that that's right the list can go on and and how much do you need yes now i, w- I want to to uh, let, come back to one thing okay. I s- how many times did i say don't panic Okay, I've been doing this 50 years. I'm, I'm not going to panic. When, you, when that's your first patient, <laughs> you're going to panic. Don't, don't, don't worry if you panic. But I'm just trying to say there are going to be things there that you can prepare yourself for because that patient is going to walk in your door at some point in time. Um, just like that baby with a congenital cataract, it's going to come in your door. That, uh, you know, these babies that, that have difficulty, cerebral palsy, that have difficulty walking, they're going to come in your door. But you look at how they look and how they engage rather than the diagnosis they're carrying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. That, that explains a lot. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, Prof. I think we have taken almost uh, all questions which uh, popped up on the chat. Thank you so much for giving us your time and, uh, you know, explaining and taking us through the journey of how should we actually go about uh, not diagnosing, but actually looking at what and how can we actually detect if there are any problems in kids, what we see in routine practices, right? Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I mean, I, I I look at all these things as opportunity because I've been doing things, as I said, for 50 years. My wife says I should write a book. Um, I don't consider myself a writer, but uh, um, I- anything I can share that will help a, a student or a young practitioner, um, the, I'm, I'm more than happy to do. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you once again. So thank you everyone for attending today's session. We do have session planned next weekend. Until then, stay home, stay safe. Uh, If you are going to your practice, please be sure that you maintain social distancing and uh, make sure that you and your patients are safe. Take care. I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye. Thank you, Prof. Have a good day. Welcome. You too. Bye. Bye.